and fortunate to have, have uh, Father Gerard with us uh, this evening. Uh, most recently, he's the founder and director of the Georgetown Environmental Justice Program. He's an economist specialized in general equilibrium theory, game theory, finance, and energy issues. Um, and he's going to speak with us tonight. And actually, he's a very, very highly sought speaker. So we're very, very happy to have him. So Father Gerard, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your invitation. Could uh, I just start with a prayer? Sorry? Could, could I just start with a prayer because Ellen's not sure, here. Sure, sure. She hasn't here yet, right, Ellen? Too. I just came. I just, oh, just. Oh, left. oh, yay, Ellen. Please, could you lead us in a prayer? Yes. Lord God, when your love spilled over into creation, you thought of us. We are from love, of love, and for love. Let our hearts, O oh God, always recognize, cherish, and enjoy your goodness in all of creation. Teach us reverence for every person and all things and energize us in your service. We hold in prayer our brothers and sisters who suffer from storms and droughts intensified by climate change. We hold all in prayer all world leaders delegated to make decisions for life. We pray that the web of life may be mended through courageous actions to limit carbon emissions. We pray for right actions for adaptation and mitigation to help our already suffering earth community. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ellen. Father Gerard. Thank you. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is to share my screen with you, if that's okay for you. Um, so someone someone should allow me to share my screen. Yes. Now I'm the co-host now. Okay. Good. Thank you. So it should work. Now you see, you see my screen, I guess. Yes. Good. So <clears throat> I'm going just to um, to use actually the slides, <clears throat> some of them, not all of them, that I used for a conference I just gave a couple of days ago at the uh, you know Pontifical Academy Pro Vita in Rome. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, and the, the best way maybe to begin is just to remind you of a beautiful work that has been published a couple of years ago in a, in a very famous journal whose title is Nature. Um, just a, maybe the entrance is to remind you that IPCC, you know, the International Panel for Climate Change Experts, um, which is publishing a report every five years, so the last report has just been published uh, two weeks ago. IPCC used to think of the future in terms of big scenarios. So you have RCP scenarios, SSP scenarios, and here I just, for, for, as a reminder, I just plotted, you know, the outcome of each scenario in terms of increase of global temperature on Earth. So this is what we observed historically, and these are projections in the future. Um, and so if we follow the, the worst scenario, SSP, the most pessimistic one, then this means that at the end of this century, we would have something like plus five degrees Celsius of, of uh, average uh, increase of global temperature on Earth. But if you are fortunate enough to follow one of these two very optimistic scenarios, then we would remain below the, three, the two degree threshold. Now, to be honest with you, there is no realistic simulation of whoever, uh, which leads to an outcome at the end of the century below the two degree threshold. Whatever being the scenario you are looking at, everybody, I mean, all the climatologists and all the, I would say, serious economists, and I hope to, to be part of them, would tell you we are going to cross the two degree threshold not very late after 2070, the latest. Now, the interesting thing I want to mention on that is that there is a beautiful work that has been done three years ago by climatologists and which starts with the very, very easy and simple experience that I'm sure most of you have made already, which is that paradoxically, it's more difficult to, to run or to jog in, in the jungle in Vietnam, let's say, than <clears throat> in the savannah or in the desert, let's say in Chad. Since I, I, I did both, I can witness that it's easier to run in Chad in the sand of the savannah than in the jungle of Vietnam. Why? 
because of humidity. Even though the temperature in Vietnam is lower than in Chad, let's say in Vietnam, you would have something like 35 degrees Celsius, in Chad, 40, 41. Um, nevertheless, it's easier to run in Chad. Why? Because it's dry. Whereas in the jungle, it's very humid. So here you have the average daily temperature. And here the y-axis is the average daily relative humidity. And this curve is the curve above which a combination of temperature and humidity becomes little, deadly for a normal human body. So maybe not for Father Gillespie, you know, because he has a very strong Irish body. But for you and me, I mean, below this, this uh, curve here, we would be dead after six hours of exposure to this kind of combination, of, let's say, of 40 degrees Celsius and, and something close to 40% of humidity. Now, the, the, the simulations of this climatologist showed that if we follow the so-called RCP 8.5, which is the most pessimistic scenario of IPCC, um, then at the end of the century, um, approximately 50% of global land area on Earth would be subject to at least 20 days per year of deadly combinations of humidity and temperature, 50% of global land area. What would be the size of human population that would be concerned by this? It's here, you can see. So approximately 75% at the end of the century. But already by 2050, this would amount to 60% of the human population. Of course, this makes sense only under the heroic assumption that people will not move. And obviously they will move. So the question is, where will this happen? And this is the next, the next chart here. So you can look at RCP 8.5. So the most pessimistic scenario. And <clears throat> so if it's, if it's dark red or brown, it means that you will have more than 300 days per year of deadly little combinations of humidity and heat. So virtually every day. And if it's, if it's yellow or light yellow, it means um, 100 days per year or so, one day over three. So if you, if you look at this, you see that if this happens, that is if we follow this very pessimistic scenario, then the entire Amazon basin will be empty, will be just uninhabitable. Big why? Because people living there or surviving there will be exposed to deadly combinations of heat and humidity virtually every day. Same story for Central America here in the Caribs here, you see. Same story for the Guinea Gulf, the Congo Basin, the Eastern coast of Africa here, the, all the coast of India and everywhere in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia here. Um, so which means, of course, people won't just die peacefully there, they will migrate. And this means billions of people who will be forced to migrate, especially if you look here in India. So the question is, where would they migrate? And that's a big, big question. You know that the World Bank is warning us already for years, if not decades, about the fact that we may have big uh, migrations of climate refugees in the second half of this century. When you look at this map, I mean, it's clear that this is a big question for the next decades. Now, interestingly enough, for us in the US, you see that the US is yellow which means in the southeastern coast of the US, um, people will be exposed to deadly combinations of heat and humidity almost one day over three, which is already something very, very cumbersome for, for a country. Same story for China here on the eastern coast of China with very small cities like Shanghai, Shenzhen, etc. Going back to the US, you may be aware of the fact that in 2019, uh, the US Army together with the NASA published a report which was providing an answer to the question, what might prevent the US Army during the decade 2020 from putting into practice its mission, whatever being the mission, what might prevent the US Army from operating at all? And the answer was twofold, and this was in 2019, before the coronavirus. The, the answer was twofold, first, pandemics, and second, uh, power blackouts. And power blackouts, you know, this, what, this is exactly what happened this year, both in California and in Texas. So this is not a fairy tale or a fantasy. It's a real problem, even for the US. That is, of course, if we have one day of a three 
of little combination of heat and humidity, people will try to rely on air conditioning to survive. Uh, but if they if they all rely on air conditioning, there will be a lot of black of blackout and power blackouts. So this might be a big problem for the entire country uh, in the next in even in the next decade. Um, so then the main question, of course, is how to avoid this nightmare. If you look at a slightly more optimistic scenario, the RCP 4.5, then the situation is less catastrophic. Here you see the US, Central America, in Africa, it's still very bad for Indonesia. Here I'm stressing this point, and you will understand why in a couple of minutes. But nevertheless, the situation as a whole is, is much better. So the big challenge is how to avoid this and how to ensure that we have some chance to reach out to something like this, even though this is certainly not ideal. But we know that we don't live in an ideal world, that global warming already began. And that the big question now is not how to get rid of global warming, but how to slow down and how to reduce it as much as possible. And at the same time, how to adapt to it. So this is essentially what we are trying to understand at the Environmental Justice Program at Georgetown University. Because of course, you, you, you imagine immediately that there is a simple answer, which is the answer sometimes I get when I discuss about these questions, which is, you know, most of the problems concern only poor countries and poor people. So we don't care. And of course, if you look at this, you see the big mistake behind this answer because the US is concerned as well, as well as China. And so with a number of very wealthy places, both in US and in China. <clears throat> now you might say, well, you know, Europe, for instance, is not concerned. Why? Because there is not enough humidity in Europe for this heat humidity problem to occur. But there are a number of other problems that I want, I want now to, to mention. So let me, let me jump immediately over this math here, uh, technical issues and yeah, and land here. So, so far I, I talked essentially about uh, global warming. So, and therefore, of course, the answer for that is, is the reduction of the consumption of fossil fuels. The, the bad news this evening is that at the world level, the world economy is still based, is, is heavily based on fossil fuel consumption. 80% uh, 80, 80 of the energy that is burned by human being on earth today still relies on fossil fuel, coal, oil, and, and gas. So the, the challenge that we are facing is to, to jump from a fossil fuel based economy that we inherited from the industrial revolution towards an economy that is essentially based on renewable energies and nuclear power. And we have to do this in a couple of decades, not more than that. And we have to start now if we want to have any chance to succeed before, let's say, 2050. Um, in addition to that, and what makes the whole story very complicated is that, I mean, global warming as such is not the unique problem. So let me now stress another issue, which is the lack of drinkable water. So this is a work that has been done by the World Resources Institute, WRI, which is a very famous think tank here in Washington, DC, <clears throat> with which we are working at Georgetown University. And what they have done over there is to simulate, to project hydro stress by 2040. So 2040 is just the day after tomorrow. And the answer, as you know, is completely different to so the map is completely different from the, why, uh, the one I was just showing to you in terms of heat humidity. You see that the Amazon Basin does not have any problem of drinkable water, nor does the Guinea Gulf and the Congo Basin. But now, I mean, the North of Africa, the South of Africa and Europe are very concerned. Central Asia is heavily concerned, China as well, India and the US again. And by what are they concerned? By the fact that they might lose something like at least 40% of the access to drinkable water by 2040. Why is this so? Because global warming is perturbing and, and damaging the, the water cycle on earth so that we have places where you have big droughts and other places where you have uh, a lot of uh, rains uh, which perturb completely the agriculture, agriculture system and, and the climate system. So, and then the, 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 the very you know, surprising thing, at least for European people is that Europe is also concerned. So Spain is already suffering from a lack of drinkable water, Portugal as well. And Italy, I was in Italy three weeks ago, they seem not to have understood the seriousness of the problem. Um, so that's why I went on, on Italian TV like, three weeks ago to say, oh, look, I mean, you, you, do you do have a problem with drinkable water in the coming, in the coming years. 
Now, uh, when I was serving as a chief economist of the French European Bank a couple of years ago, <clears throat> I, I, had a long, I had long conversations with the governments of Morocco here and Tunisia here. Um, why? Because they already faced this huge problem of the loss of drinkable water, and they both want to rely on the desalinization of seawater, uh, the Mediterranean Sea for Tunisia, and the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Sea for, for Morocco. The problem is that in order to desalinize water, you need a lot of energy. It's very costly, not just in terms of dollars but also in, or money, but also in terms of energy. And fortunately, Morocco has a huge uh, power plant in, in Warzazat, a solar power plant, but Tunisia doesn't have the analog of Warzazat. So Tunisia faces a big challenge, which might even lead to food insecurity in this country in the coming years, because they don't have, they don't produce enough energy uh, in order to desalinize water. So you see now that there is a link between energy and water. In order to have water in the next decades, probably we will need more energy because a number of countries will have to rely on desalinization of water. But this energy at the same time must be clean. Otherwise we are just worsening the climate change problem. So now you see the interplay between hydro stress, lack of drinkable water on the one hand, and energy and global warming on the other hand. There is an, a nexus between water and energy, which makes the whole climate change problem much more complicated than what we used to think usually. Now, unfortunately, that's still not the end of the story. There is another issue which is barely known in the, in the grand public, which is the growing scarcity of minerals. Um, this is, these uh, graphs are taken from a research article I published some years ago with uh, a friend of mine who is a French geophysicist, Olivier Vidal. Um, and here you have, for instance, I don't know whether you see it clearly, you have the, the extraction curve of both copper, zinc, and aluminum on Earth. So you see that everything serious begins after the Second World War uh, due to the, the massive mainstreaming of you know, industrialization. And, and, uh, and mass consumption. But if you show this curve to a geophysicist, he or she will tell you, well, you know, it is just impossible that we have this forever. Why? Because there is a finite quantity of both copper, zinc, and aluminum on Earth. So sooner or later, we will reach what we call a peak of extraction. That is, this curve will bend because we won't be able to increase furthermore the quantity of mineral that we extract from Earth. This is especially true for copper. So what we have shown with my colleague is that we might reach, we should reach, unfortunately, the peak of extraction of copper at the world level before 2060. Why is that so? Because um, the density of reserves of copper where we are actually um, extracting copper is falling down at a very, very rapid pace. So the density today is 1%, which means that in order to extract one ton of copper, you need to grab 100 tons of soil. Whereas 25, 30 years ago, the density was 5%. Now it's 1% uh, after more, a little bit more than one generation. So, and it's still falling, that, falling down. And now you see the link between minerals, water and energy. Why? Because in order to extract minerals, you need a lot of energy and a lot of water. You need also water in order to, you know, just distinguish copper from the other minerals and the soil among the 100 tons of soil that you have, you have grabbed, you see. So there are a number of countries, especially in Latin, of Latin America today, which are very rich in minerals. Uh, let's say, for instance, Bolivia, but they can't extract these minerals. They can't exploit them. Why? Because they don't have enough energy and water. And this is this might become a problem for us in the coming decades for at least two reasons. The first one is that we, our industry, be it in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in China, uh, in Thailand, uh, relies heavily on minerals. That's not a news, that's not a surprise. But in addition to that, if we switch towards renewable energies, which as you have understood, we, we must go, we must do now in the coming years, then we will need more and more of certain minerals, including copper. Infrastructures linked to uh, renewable energies require much more copper than infrastructures linked to fossil fuels. Uh, 
So geophysicists like my colleague Olivier Vidal and others are already warning us today saying, look guys, you should be very, very careful with what you're doing in terms of minerals, especially on copper. You should recycle it in, in a systematic way. Why? Because it might be the case that in the coming decades, we might have a shortage of clean energy because we don't have enough copper, which would be very stupid. So you see now there is a kind of nexus between energy, water, and minerals. So in order to have water, you need energy. In order, in order to have minerals, you need energy and water. Um, and in order to have energy, clean energy, you need a certain number of minerals, including copper. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, minerals, as you know, certainly are not completely, I mean, are not spread in the, on Earth in a fair way, to, to put it this way. So because there are some countries like China, which are very rich in minerals, so these are all the minerals that you would find in China. And there are other places on Earth which are very poor. So a large part of Africa, except for the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo, uh, uh, and Europe is very poor. So the US has some minerals, but not all of them, which means those countries which rely on exports of and imports of minerals are heavily dependent upon international trades in minerals. And the experience that we have made during the pandemics, the coronavirus pandemics, is that, you know, these big international value chains that we have built in the, in the past 30 years uh, and which have, have led to this extraordinary uh, phenomenon that we call globalization are very fragile. The virus was enough to paralyze a number of places where a number of factories could not work, could not operate, and this has damaged a number of value chains. And still today, as you know, there are a number of value chains um, which don't operate because of the consequences of the pandemic. So, which means that we can't dream that we will have a peaceful world in the coming decades where we will still be able to have, you know, ongoing uh, international trades of minerals um, without having to make sure that the value chains associated to this trade is more robust than it was in the past, which is a big geopolitical challenge, as you can imagine. Um, so the next point, of course, is, and I'm sure you know that, is the rise of the sea level because of global warming. So the, 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 the main scenario today is that we will have a rise of the sea level above plus one meter at the end of this century. It might be 1.5 meter. Um, the most pessimistic scenario uh, suggests something like plus two meters, but this is unlikely to happen. So something like plus 1.5 meter might be, unfortunately, might be a reasonable guess. Um, and you know that New York, for instance, is protected only for against 1.4 meter. So which means that uh, if unfortunately the quote unquote reasonable scenario uh, takes place, then we will have to, be, to, to build big dikes in order to protect New York. Um, so here, this is a projection for 2050 in, for Jakarta in Indonesia. And uh, as you see, so these are two main scenarios. Uh, the, the dark one is the, 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 more, the most uh, optimistic one, and the light one is the most pessimistic one. But both suggest that Jakarta will be underwater before 2050. Same story for Bangkok. You see the water might be go very deep into the land around Bangkok. So Bangkok will be underwater before 2050. The same story, same story for Bangladesh. You know that most, more than half of the country of Bangladesh will be underwater before 2050. And same story for the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. The Mekong Delta in Vietnam, this is one thing about, about, about which I worked as a chief economist of the, the French European Bank, uh, because the Vietnamese government asked us to help them figure out what they could do to slow down the pace at which uh, the laguna of the Mekong Delta is going down because of the urbanization process on the Mekong Delta on the one hand, and because of the rise of the sea level and what they could do in terms of food security, because the Mekong Delta is the place where they cultivate rice for the entire country. So as you can imagine, this is far from being easy. Unfortunately, the IMF does not help because the IMF has no clue about what to do for these kind of problems. And the World Bank is not as useful as it could be. Why? Because the World Bank, at least this is my experience, 
but if you have another experience, I'm happy to, to, to discuss this. Uh, my experience is that, you know, the research department at the World Bank is doing a very good job. So I have a number of colleagues who are very good researchers working at the World Bank and they publish very important articles, but most of the operations people don't read these articles. So operations people at the World Bank still repeat the same recipe. That is, uh, you have to flexibilize the labor market, you have to open the frontiers to uh, make yourself available for globalization, but this does not help for these kind of problems. How do you want Thailand to face this issue if you just ask Thailand to flexibilize its labor market? So you need much more than that. Um, and, and obviously most of these countries are very, you know, are left alone. So a, a huge aspect of, um, an important aspect of the work I want to do at the Environmental Justice Program in Georgetown University is to follow up what I did was when I was serving as a chief economist of the France Global Bank, that is to, to tell these governments, you know, we could help you. Um, we have a bunch of very good researchers who, go, who can go to the field. These uh, lead to a number of case studies for our students. And uh, we are ready to try to think with you about solutions. So in, to a certain extent, I would say the, the program I, I'm trying to build is a solution provider, both for minorities which are trapped uh, by climate change, I think, let's say, of Louisiana and all these people living in the, in the yellow you know, coast of the US I showed you a couple of minutes ago, uh, for minorities, for companies which need to invest in safe places and also for governments. So a program that would provide solutions for them to fight against, you know, this conundrum where you find both a lack of drinkable water, global warming, and a, and a growing scarcity of minerals. Um, the next point I want to mention is directly linked to the pandemic, which is that unfortunately, um, it turns out that global warming will also most probably spread further tropical diseases, tropical uh, pandemics like malaria. So here you have a map that has been uh, made, produced by the World Bank, the researchers at the World Bank, who are doing a very good job, as I said. Uh, so the red places are places where we should have malaria by 2050 and where there is no malaria today. And as you see, the US is concerned. So which means in one generation, malaria will be back in the US. And the question is, how do you repair the poor population living there uh, to face this problem. Um, as you know, for the time being, we don't have any vaccine against malaria. Um, same question for people in Mongolia or in Central Asia or, or even here in Australia, you see, or, or of course in, in Paraguay, Paraguay and Uruguay in, in Latin America. So, um, so that's why my center and my program will work hand in hand also with the, the uh, Filipino, the uh, Pellegrino Center, sorry, and the Kennedy Institute at Georgetown University, which are two labs dedicated to uh, bioethics and medical ethics. So we try to figure out how we can use the type of models I'm working on with my team to try to project scenarios of global warming, lack of drinkable water, growing scarcity of minerals, uh, and at the same time, pandemics. So how can we face these issues and help you know, build um, empowerment empower poor population, poor minorities, so that they can face these kind of issues. <clears throat> um, I jump immediately to the last problem I want to mention, and I'm sorry that maybe the, the landscape I'm, I'm building now is very gloomy, but, but you know, that's, that's just science. So I think at a certain point, we need to face reality. So, and this is, this is a biomass. Uh, biomass, to my, in my opinion, is the fourth item of the big nexus that we are facing today. So the first three items were energy, water, minerals, and the fourth one is biomass. So this map has been, has been made by a friend of mine, Mark Imhoff, who at this time was working for NASA. And this is just the production of biomass on Earth. Of course, you, you see, you recognize here, the Amazon jungle, the jungle of Central America here, the jungle, the forest, the rainforest of Congo, and here, of course, the jungle in Indonesia. And now here you see the consumption of biomass by human beings, which is a completely different map, of course. You see that people are consuming a lot of biomass in the north of India, uh, but they are not producing so much biomass in the north of India here. Um, same story for China, the north, 
uh, east and northern part of China here, Europe, the north of the US and Canada here, and again, Indonesia, the Java island in particular. So now if you, if you compute the balance, so that is the difference between what people consume and what they can produce locally, you get this picture. And you get that the number of places are in deficit. So if they are red or, or dark red or brown or, or black, so it means they have a huge deficit. So that they are consuming twice or three times or four times what they can produce locally. Uh, where, whereas if they are, they are uh, dark blue, then they are in balance. But you see dark blue places are very rare on earth. So this means that in the Arabic Peninsula here in the north of India, here in the north of China, they might be in trouble in the coming decades. Why? Because they rely on imports of biomass. Um, and as I said earlier, we can't take for granted that globalization will survive the next pandemics. It has been already deeply damaged by the coronavirus. Um, and it's far from being obvious that we can keep it the way it, it worked beautifully in the past 30 years. Um, you know, for instance, the, the big geopolitical narrative that China is building today, relying on the Silk Belt Road, is not a peaceful one, despite what, what Xi Jinping would pretend. It's just a way for China to say, you know, we have a claim on everything on earth that is interesting for us, especially um, uh, um, mineral resources. So China is just actually, uh, you know, taking a lot of resources from Africa, especially, in order to use it for domestic purposes. And it's not, it's not fostering development in Africa, at least that's my viewpoint. We can discuss it, but anyway. So I just, just want to pinpoint that in order to say even, you know, even food security is not guaranteed in a number of places, especially in India here, because you have this problem of biomass. So you have a lack of local production of biomass. And at the same time, you have the glaciers in Himalaya, which are melting. And this goes back, this boils down to the, the lack of drinkable water. So big rivers uh, here like the Gange will reduce, will shrink, and even will might disappear before the end of this century. And at the same time, they will need more and more imports of biomass, which might create a lot of, a lot of trouble. Once again, Indonesia is in trouble. So I'm, I'm stressing, I'm emphasizing the fact that whatever being the, the, the lens through which you look at the problem, Indonesia is always a multi-country. Remember that uh, Indonesia was in bad shape here, lacking of treatment water, and was also in bad shape um, here uh, due to a peak of heat and humidity. So Indonesia is going to face everything. It's the multi-country for the next decades. Lack of drinkable water, peak of heat and humidity, uh, typhoons, uh, lack of biomass, uh, seismic activity, volcanic activity, etc. So you know that uh, Jakarta is no longer the uh, the capital city of Indonesia. Indonesia shifted its capital city last year because Jakarta is already falling down into water because of the rise of the sea level. Uh, but it, this is just the beginning of the problems for Indonesia. And well, you know, sometimes I'm asking myself, where are these people going to migrate? Indonesia is the most populous Muslim country in the world. Today, 270 million people, but in a couple of years, 300 million people for sure. I'm very skeptical about the, the possibility for them to migrate to Australia. I don't believe that Australia will be very hospitable. I'm very skeptical about the opportunity for them to migrate to the courtyard uh, of China, namely Vietnam and Thailand. Um, so Malaysia will be an obvious spot for them, but will not be sufficient. Malaysia cannot absorb 300 million people. So this will certainly become a big problem in the coming decades. So that's why that, that's essentially in a nutshell what we are looking at in my, in my program, trying first to understand what the problem at stake is. Um, so to figure out some projections, let's say, what about if the Biden administration was to implement a carbon tax, what would be the impact both in terms of, you know, employment, inflation, that, et cetera, in the US, but also in terms of climate. Um, what, how can we help a number of countries face the big challenges they are facing? So right now we have a, a program for Mongolia to help Mongolia. We have another program for Mayotte, which is a French archipelago here in the, in the Indian Ocean. And, uh, and we are going to probably to work 
with a, a society called uh, Global Sovereign Advisory, which advises uh, around 20 governments on earth uh, for the public finances. And so we are going to provide simulation scenarios for global warming, a lack of, of water, etc. And also we are working for Deloitte, the, the consulting company, which is interested in, in our work because Deloitte wants to be able to give advices to its clients. So big companies need to be aware of what I'm talking about. They need to know that, they need to know if we have a chance to avoid that, and they need to know where water is going to be to be missing, where we're going to miss uh, minerals and these kind of things, and what to do against that. So of course, there are a number of solutions. Uh, si since time is running, I don't have time in to, to enter into all these details, but let me just mention one solution, which is certainly part of the solution, which is not the entire story which is agroecology. So agroecology is a way for farmers to, to jump from the fossil fuel-based agriculture that we have today to an agriculture that is respectful of both wild and domestic biodiversity and which produces food for people even, even under global warming and, uh, without, and with clean energy. So um, this is one aspect of the story. The other aspect is certainly uh, low-tech industry we have to learn how to have manufactured products that are easy to recycle, uh, easy to repair. So that's exactly the opposite of what we are doing today, which we are, we are wasting a number of minerals and energy uh, with, uh, let's say, computers and laptops, which are obsolete after five years, whatever we do. So we, we, we should do exactly the opposite, have long-term products uh, that we can recycle. The unique country which is recycling in a very systematic way, to the best of my knowledge, is China. Europe is just starting um, implementing a big program in order to have recycling as a, as a necessity for everybody. Um, and the US should begin to start. Of course, here and there, people are recycling already, already, fortunately, but this is not yet, as I see, uh, a very systematic um, you know, concern for everybody, everybody in the US. So I will stop here to be able to, to leave room for questions and answers. Thank you. Who would like to ask the first question? Thank you very much, Father. You're welcome. Ben? Uh, yes, have you made this presentation to any um, officials of the uh, US government, but congressional members or senators or anything like that? Not yet, not yet. I think, I, 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 thank you, John, I think we should work on trying to get that done. Okay, with pleasure. Thank you. Uh, this may be a simple question, but what can us uh, average ordinary U.S. citizens do uh, to mitigate at least some of the, uh, the scenarios that you paint? Oh, there are, I mean, there are a lot of answers to this. First, you know, for instance, there are a number of places in the, especially in the southeastern coast of the U.S., which will be underwater. So we should just stop selling houses in place this is where we know people will be underwater. This is just, I believe this is just criminal to do this today. So this is a simple, simple thing that we should just prohibit. Um, so US citizens should not allow this to happen. So this is one thing. The other thing is probably we have to change our, our meal in the sense that, you know, meat is producing a lot of CO2. So we should, in order to reduce the CO2 footprint of our meal, we have to, first of all, to reduce the waste you know that we don't consume about 35% of what it's, what's in our, in our fridge. So which means these, these are 35%, 35%, sorry, of, of food which is produced and which emits CO2, which we not even consume. So it's a waste of money, it's a waste of CO2, it's a waste of everything. So we should, we should probably try, you know, for most of us to become vegetarian in order to reduce the carbon footprint and then to learn how not to waste food. So, for instance, when I, I went to Italy uh, three weeks ago, I gave a conference with Carlo Petrini, who is the founder of Slow Food, which is a, an interesting concept where you say, why the hell should we eat rapidly? You see, fast food, why? Who said we should eat rapidly, quickly? To work more, what does it mean? 
So he's a very interesting guy and he's very close to the Pope actually. So we had a beautiful this conversation. Um, and then if you, if you enter into, you, you know, if you, you take the key of, of food, then you have a number of questions which are coming into the, into the picture. Uh, how do we organize the society in such a way that people can take time to eat, to cook, to grow the plants that they are eating, the vegetables? Let me just give you an example. I, I'm also teaching at um, Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Um, and uh, Father Gillespie knows my colleague, uh, Mark Swilling, who is the founder of the beautiful Sustainability Institute over there, because he's visiting us right now. He's in at Washington, D.C., a South African prof. And um, so when I go there, it's, it's just incredible because everybody is vegetarian in the campus and everybody goes gardening before entering the classroom, the profs and the students and doing permaculture in the gardens of the university. So myself, I go gardening 20 minutes, 30 minutes with my students every morning. And I can, I can tell you when you do this and you enter the classroom, this creates an atmosphere, pedagogical atmosphere with the students, which is which is just unique. Um, and in this campus, all the electricity comes from PV on the roofs, water is entirely recycled, all the waste are recycled, everything. So this is the type of, you know, very simple, it looks simple, but when, when you try to do it, uh, you, you, you really see both the resistance and the difficulty and uh, yeah, but I, I think we can do it at, this, at the level of citizens. Now, um, this is not sufficient for sure. So there are a number of, I have some researchers come, some colleagues who computed that as a citizen, what I can do is reduce my <clears throat> carbon footprint by 20, 25%. And if I'm a very austere Franciscan brother, you know, then maybe 30%. Um, and that's it. So there remains 70%, which depend upon big companies and upon the state. So we need also big public investment, which is ex exactly what the Biden administration is trying to do. And I do believe that they are perfectly right. So we need a Green New Deal for the US. We, we need a Green New Deal for Europe, which is which I'm advocating as a French guy for years now. Uh, we, we need a Green New Deal in China, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we need both. So as a US citizen, I can only, you know, try to change my meal, reduce my waste, reduce my carbon footprint. Of course, the way I'm, I'm, I move my car, all this have an impact. So, so if it's possible, move from a thermic car to an electric car and at least a hybrid car, you know, these very simple gestures, but which might be costly. Uh, this, is, this is possible for me. And then, and then of course, feed a, a, a political debate in the public scene so that uh, the political class understands that this is a priority. Um, and that the Green New Deal is what we need, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Gael, uh, uh, Kevin, would you say something about your work with the Vatican as well as the Society of Jesus internationally, your meetings there? Yeah. Um, so I have two uh, entrance doors. One is the Pontifical Academy Pro Vita where I provide essentially scientific advices. Uh, but the second one uh, regards directly the Society of Jesus because I was asked by the Father General to promote the um, ecological transition and let's say Laudato Si in the 150 Jesuit universities in the world. So we are probably the unique international community with the Jesuits to have an access to 150 universities. And the idea is that if these 150 universities at the same time, you know, uh, struggle in the direction of, of the, the, the ecological transition, this will have leverage effect, tremendous leverage effect on all the universities. And if you have an effect on all the universities, you have a big effect on the next generation. You are just doing your job, which is really to prepare the next generation, our youth for the big challenges that they're already facing today. So, yeah, my idea is that I'm going to send, to share with these Jesuit universities a, a preliminary version of a Laudato, Laudato Si platform that they could discuss. I will tell them, you know, look, I wrote it. So it's too French, too Eurocentric, too, I don't know, whatever you want. You will rewrite it, but we will help you rewriting it 
we write it. And then let maybe in one year, we, I mean, in August 2022, we have a big meeting at Boston College. Unfortunately, it's not at Georgetown, but anyway, uh, with all the president of all the Jesuit universities, with the Father General, and then we will brainstorm about this Lauda to see platform. And then hopefully one year later, we end up with a chart and we will be able to say to Jesuit universities, you have the Jesuit label, and that's fine, congrats. But you know, this implies some duties. Now you have to implement the loud OTC chart. And if you're not, if you if you're not happy with that, you had two years to discuss, to bargain, to complain, to yell, or whatever. You see? So so that's the plan. Ah, Wonderful. Other thoughts or questions? And Ellen has a question. Ellen? To, um, Father Gerard, um, when does your program at Georgetown begin? When do you start taking new students? Um, so I began in February, but I was completely alone in February when I arrived. Uh, Kevin saw that. I arrived in the midst of the lockdown, you know, it was gray and cold and et cetera. Um, and everybody was just uh, <laughs> um, behind the Zoom screen. Uh, now I have a team of 12 brilliant scholars working with me. Some of them come regularly to eat at the rectory. So if you want to join us for a dinner one day at the rectory, you are very, very welcome. Uh, thanks to the hospitality of Kevin, Father Gillespie, we can do that, you know, in the beautiful veranda of the rectory. Um, and we have our offices on M Street. So we work there. Uh, I have this um, very nice colleague from South Africa who is working with me. And we have a number of PhD students working. So we began already. I'm going to teach in the spring 2022 at the Marco School of Public Policy um, because I can't teach earlier. I have to, I'm too busy with, you know, just founding the program. And this is where, how we began. Carolyn? So students, just to follow up briefly, so students can apply now oh, yeah. for any semester 2020, well, 2022, they can apply. Yeah. Okay. And they can also apply if they want to work as research assistant or, you know, we need so many people to work with us. And it's a graduate program, correct? Oh, yeah, it's yeah. a graduate okay. program. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Right. And they can also apply to cook the dinners at the rectory. Oh, yeah, <laughs> because I must confess, I'm not a great cook. Oh, so. he's very good. <laughs> um, but and we can does. take it out of the garden. So that's wonderful. Carolyn. Thank you, Father Giro. Um, first of all, I yeah. wanted to say how impressed I was about your story about when you lived in Chad and you chose the second year you were there to live among the poor, fetch your own water, sleep with the boys in this abandoned theater. I've spent my career working on African countries, so I was very moved by that. Um, secondly, you mentioned don't sell houses to people in places that will go underwater. Well, you know, in this country, as you know, I'm sure there's so much resistance to people not having houses on the coast, to people wanting houses as close as possible, and also to destroying wetlands. You know, the, the destruction of the wetlands has been a problem for a very long time. Yeah. So when you say what we as citizens can do, you're, you're talking about advocacy to state and local governments, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly, yeah. I mean, because I don't think we're gonna have much luck with individual homeowners. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> afford houses on the coast. Okay, and then lastly, um, I was very impressed by what you said about Stellenbosch University. Yeah. Are they sharing or working with any other African universities in terms of their their approach? Now, it's a different story in most African countries because sure. there are more, but there are many universities. So yeah, you're right. So we have um, they have a partnership with Ethiopia. So I have an Ethiopian PhD student working with me now which is extraordinary um, because as you know, you may know, Ethiopia was never colonized. Yes, so I, Ethiopian, I there a lot, yes. Yeah, so Ethiopian people are very unique actually in Africa and the relationships they have with us is really, really extraordinary. So, so yeah, so we have a link with Ethiopia, with South Africa. For the time being, I don't have any further link, but you may know that there are a lot of Jesuits working in, in Abidjan, Ivory Coast, in Cameroon, so I'm I'm going to develop this. Also, the Ekima College in Kenya, of course, uh, Kinshasa. So I'm going to develop this, but you know, step by step. So, yeah. So this is certainly on the horizon. Or horizon. Uh, merci. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. John Metzler. 
Uh, yeah, uh, I think that you laid out the uh, the problem very well from a global scale. But I was wondering a little bit about how we get solutions. And Bill Gates has a book out on climate change, and he was, much to my surprise, quite optimistic about fusion energy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and then, um, so I'm wondering if your work, are you going to look down the road and do like technical forecasting and appreciate the impact that stuff can have? The other question I had um, is, um, how will the how do you send in the economic round price and value how do you send the signals will the market economy really be able to work in the world of climate change so it's a two prong yeah two, two big questions so on the first question i'm a little bit embarrassed because um in europe the the viewpoint of most nuclear physicists is that we will have nuclear fusion but not earlier than by 2080 so I, I even have some colleagues working as nuclear physicists who joined my team uh, working on economics with me because they say, we, you know, we know that what we are working on will be useless in order to address the big challenges of our generation. So they, they, they are ready to give up nuclear fusion to work on more, you know, sensitive topics for today. But in the US, to my own surprise, some people seem to believe that we might have nuclear fission much earlier and in industrial applications of nuclear fission earlier. So I don't know who is right, but to the best of my knowledge, being myself French, we won't have nuclear fission between before 2080. So which means it's not the solution for the next you know 50 years. So we definitely need to have an alternative to that. Uh, on the second question, um, there are well, on the one hand, you know, there is the so-called green finance, which is growing today. To be honest with you, I'm somewhat skeptical about the greenness of green finance. So to give just one example, green bonds are not greener than any normal bond, unfortunately. <laughs> um, they are neither more nor less green or brown, as I like it. Um, but fortunately, there are a number of countries which are now really uh, moving out of the fossil fuel based economy. Let me just give you an example, which is South Africa. Um, you know that South Africa is heavily based on coal and you could hardly imagine South Africa without coal. And nevertheless, they are really now withdrawing from coal. So they are even inventing a very, a very, very innovative and an extraordinary mechanism in order to save the power the big company which is producing power for the entire country, whose name is ESCOM, and who is virtually bankrupt uh, because ESCOM relies heavily on coal, coal plants. And they decided this year that they will close their coal plants. They want to open new coal plants and they need to shift towards renewables in the next five years. But for that purpose, they need to, see, they need to save ESCOM. So they are going to imagine a, a, a debt swap where the creditors of ESCOM would forgive part of the debt under the condition that ESCOM finances <clears throat> renewable energies. Wow. And so this means there is a kind of maturity, yeah, of the finance financial sphere, which has understood that the future now is renewable energy. And they are ready to make, you know, very heterodox solutions make possible. So this is also what I'm trying to push in Europe, but I can tell you, I mean, you know, orthodoxy mainstream thinking is very, very strong in Europe and not just in the US, but also in Europe. So it's far from being easy, but I do believe at the end of the day, <clears throat> some people start really understand that the situation is serious and we need to find innovative solutions. So I'm, I'm to, to a certain extent, I'm optimistic. Oh, thank you. Oh. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I'm just saying I'm willing to cook the dinner. Oh, oh good. there you go. Thank I'm you. a Frenchman, I'm not so sure. <laughs> She's 100% Italian. Yeah, you may have to oh, go Italian. Oh, Italian. Oh, <laughs> che bello. Bien sûr, bien sûr. <laughs> ah, facciamo la cucina italiana insieme. <laughs> I'm, also, I'm also Italian and I'm also willing to cook. <laughs> oh, beautiful, che bello. Well, now we have the food covered. Any other <laughs> any other issues that we want to talk about? 
Uh, Father, I, 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 we can't thank you enough. I, I mean, for all the wonderful work you're doing, especially with, with the Jesuit universities, I, many of us have, have uh, been trained at one level or another as, as Jesuits uh, in Jesuit universities. So that's very, very heartening. Um, and Ashley is going to know, is making, is making a copy of this. So we will send it out as broadly as we can. Uh, you may get a lot more email than you ever wanted or hoped to pay for. <laughs> um, but, you know, picking up on a couple of things, I think we can work as a group and uh, in, in getting you before the Congress. I don't know. Ben Ben is the person. He used to work as a, a lobbyist. We have a bunch of lobbyists uh, and lawyers at Holy Trinity, so maybe we can work on that. Um, and certainly the advocacy with state and local and federal government is very, very key. So. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, you again very very much for your time oh I thank you thank you thank thank god for you thank god for you thank you, thank so, you father bye -bye. good night all right good night everybody thank you thanks for your patience thank you all for coming thanks john for arranging it this is great <laughs> thank ashley <laughs> and father kevin you did it father kevin